Lord, we thank you for gathering us here again tonight to seek your healing touch. Lord, there are so many things that we bring to the hospitals and doctors who have great skills and great treatments. But so many of the things that ail us, Lord, are not amenable to this kind of healing because only you, only you, Lord, can heal us of so uh, much that afflicts us. This is a reading from the Gospel of Mark about the blind man from Jericho. And they came to Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth passing by, he began to call out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. And many people scolded him and told him to keep quiet. But he shouted all the louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, saying, take heart, get up, he is calling you. He immediately threw off his cloak and jumped up and went to Jesus. Then Jesus asked him, what is it you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Master, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he could see, and he followed Jesus along the road. What is it you want me to do for you? That's what Jesus asked the blind man. Of course he knew. He knew the man was blind. He could, he could see that very clearly. And yet, he elicited the, an answer to this question. For the blind man said to him, Lord, let me see again. Now, blindness is not something that that people take lightly, physical blindness that is. But there is a blindness that afflicts us and it's a blindness of the spirit where people lose their sight of God. They're not much concerned about that at the time because it's convenient for them maybe. But later on they look for, for Christ. And because of their blindness, because of their, they have neglected to look for Christ in those places where they can find him, they can't find him. They don't know how to go there. I remember one many years ago, a man came to me, uh, and uh, he was a professional man here in Dublin. And he related to me how he had, as a boy, come to Dublin to go to college and how he graduated and entered into a very profitable and uh, lucrative career. And he said, he said, Father, two years ago, um, I was diagnosed with brain cancer. And he said, the doctor told me that he would give me treatment, which he did. And he said, probably you, you, you will find these headaches recurring. And he said, that will be a sign to you, if they do, that you have a short time to live. And he said, here I am. The headaches are back. I said, why are you coming to me? Well, he said, somebody told me that you were a priest that I could go to. And he said, 
can you do anything for me? And I did, of course. I, I evangelized him again into the faith that he always had. He said, you know, I realize now that my father and mother's disappointment in me, despite my worldly success, they were disappointed in me that I had given up my faith. And he said, you know, I now realize that they were right. And so I, I, I said, no, come back to me next week. I want to hear your confession and I'll anoint you and we'll talk and uh, I'll pray with you, which he did. And uh, I heard his confession and I gave him his first communion in about 30 years. And he left and I said, now come back. I'm going away, I said, to give missions and I won't be back for two or three weeks. Yeah, I said, come back and see me when I, get, when I get back. But when I got back, his wife phoned me to tell me that he had taken suddenly very ill and died shortly after that. But he died well. He had a good death because he encountered the healing Christ through my ministry. And I often think of the person that told him to come and see me, what he accomplished that person, whoever he or she was. Because out of that came a great conversion and a great spiritual healing and a death that gave glory to God. So there are also the healings, brothers and sisters, you know, that people need, many, many people need nowadays, which is why we are being asked by Pope Francis and many others before him, and many bishops and priests, you know, don't neglect an opportunity to do good for somebody's soul. Don't neglect that. There are many, many people out there who are in dire need, great need of coming back to the church. The only thing is they don't know how to do it. They're lost. They need to be found again. But you and I know that apart from those types of conversion, there are many, many things in our hearts, our broken hearts and our broken spirits that need to be healed and only, only Christ, only our blessed Savior can do that for us. And so I would say to you for yourself or for anybody you know who seems lost, nobody is ever lost when there is breath in them. Nobody. And Sister Breeze and I could stand here and tell you stories unending about these kind of graces that come to people. So tonight we are here to get healed of those kind of things. Healed of attitudes. You know, negative, judgmental attitudes, prejudices, like the racism which is so rampant nowadays. Healed of memories. Things that rise up in your past with murderous attacks on our peace of mind. The healing of memories. The healing of all kinds of, of um, neuroses that afflict us. So tonight we come here into the presence of Jesus and the presence of this woman, Sister Bridge, who has such an amazing charism from the Lord to pray for healing. But remember, here is the healer. This is the healer. Jesus is the healer. So Lord, we come before you now, I come before you. 
I don't even know what's wrong with me, Lord, but there is something. There's always something the matter with me that needs your healing touch. I believe in you. I love you. I hope in you, Lord Jesus, and I love you. And Mary, refuge of sinners, health of the sick, mother of the church, please, please sit with us tonight and join your wonderful prayers and the prayers of the saints to our poor prayers. Amen. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It is such a privilege and a joy and a blessing for us to be here with Jesus. And one of my favorite quotes from St. Faustina, what Jesus said, you know, when we look at this, at this host, the humility, the simplicity, remember what Jesus said to Faustina. He said, you know, I'm not an object, I'm a person. And I say it all over the world because most of, most of our healing services are conducted in the presence of the Holy Eucharist. <clears throat> and I tell them, for Catholics, you don't need Sister Breach and you don't need healers because we have Jesus. And what he's asking of us is that we have faith. And as Father Kevin said there, you know, I have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that the Lord wants and desires, like Bartimaeus, he wants us to pray. Bartimaeus was praying, but he was discouraged. You know, people can discourage us <clears throat> and say, now don't be expecting a miracle. Or they'll say to you, you know, why should you expect to be healed? Or we say to ourselves, now if I was holier, and if I was better, <clears throat> and we, we, we discourage ourselves if I had more faith. And I often think, one of my, the passages when I was praying yesterday at my convent, I made a holy hour for all of you. Every time I go to speak at places, you know, I spend a lot of time in adoration because I always think of what dear mother Angelica said to me oh, 40 plus years ago when I began this ministry. I was, I was really nervous and worried. And I remember going to, to the monastery there. This is before EWTN, before radio. There was just six nuns in the convent, including her mother who had come to the convent. And I remember sitting at adoration, and I had all these books to figure out how you pray for healing, why people don't get healed, all the right prayers, I should say. I mean, I was so, I don't know. Anyway, I would list off and pray for them, that I'd learn all these things, because if I'm doing this, you have to know about it. And the next morning, I couldn't remember a thing. So Mother Angelica took me by the hand, and she was pretty feisty at that time. This is going back 40 some years. And she took me by the hand and she walked me up in front of the monstrance because they had perpetual adoration, as you know. And she looked at me and with that squeaky voice that she had, she said, if Jesus wanted you to be Francis McNutt or all these other people, he would have made you. But he wants you just to be yourself. And that's the healer. And don't be learned styles from other people. Go to Jesus. And that was the best wisdom because in these years, thank God for Father Kevin because going, joining with Father Kevin in his ministry where he had founded the intercession, 
but then around the world. We began, and he was the one who introduced it in Korea, above all places. We were asked to minister to the bishops at the bishops conference. We were wondering, how can we pray for them? And it was there that we got the inspiration. Bring them before the monstrance. Bring them before Jesus. And then we began, which is now worldwide. But you know, my brothers and sisters, the, the image that comes to me often, and today even came to me, do you remember the story of the apostles? They were with Jesus. And then he said to them, you know, you go ahead. And they went, got into a boat. And there's different versions, but Jesus came and he got into the boat with them. And they're out on the water. And a terrible storm comes. And they were fishermen. They, were, they knew the sea. So, of course, they were going to try and control this boat. But then they got desperate. They couldn't do a thing. And then they turned to Jesus and it says, they said to him, Lord, save us. We are lost. And Jesus woke up. Was he asleep? And he looked at them and then he looked and he stood up and he calmed the elements. The storm settled. Then he looked at them and he said to them, Why are you so afraid? O oh, you of little faith. Well, we're not in a boat. And Jesus is not, but we are in. We're living in storms often. And the storms are not the storms of sea. But I listen to you today of cancer, depression, anxiety, all the things. These are all the storms that come to us. We find ourselves being confronted with what is beyond our power to do anything. And I can tell you firsthand that, you know, I know what it's like. I, t I was saying to somebody today, you know, I was miraculously healed, as you know, from my book. Then I, uh, just about three years ago, I've had good health for many years. And um, a few years ago, I got, it was my golden jubilee year. And I said, like the little, like as the great St. Teresa said, I said to Jesus, when you hear what happened to me, I had this golden jubilee, wonderful celebration over in Al Hallows. The priests were all going to celebrate mass for me every day during my jubilee year. I went back to America, got meningitis, got a virus and spent the year in terrible pain, desperate. And I said, if that's what you do to your friends for my golden jubilee, this was the present. But you know, it taught me that sometimes we can control or we, we think we have everything in hand or which all I could do was go into adoration every day. I cried because the Mayo Clinic couldn't find. I was losing the power of my legs. I had these, this awful virus that un stripped the whole nerves of covering in my body. And all I could do, and that's why when I was listening to you today, it's very hard to pray with, you know, your mind, and your, but you pray with your body, in your cancer, in all the ways that we suffer, physical and mental. Sometimes the only thing what I could do in the front of the Blessed Sacrament was I said, Jesus, I'm here. And in the human way, you're almost afraid to say, Lord, whatever is your will, in case he was going to leave me with it. <laughs> you know, it's the human in us. We all love Jesus, but we don't want to go yet. And you know, I used to say, Jesus, I can't pray, but I offer this to you. Well, I think, you know, my brothers and sisters, I learned that I had to just let the Lord do what he wanted. And it's at those moments when you let go, and I say this in suffering, we are all going to die. That's a guarantee. And we're all going to somehow be, have those storms. But our storms can be transformed 
by our disposition and our attitude. And the only place to change that is here. Only Jesus can take my pain and yours and do something wonderful with it. And because we're going to pray with you tonight, but I have to tell you <clears throat> that I had a brother, Pether. Many of you maybe heard me talk about Pether. Pether was the, the, my brother next to me. We, we grew up together. And he, a wonderful little man up in South Armagh, a, a farmer, loves horses, has lo had 25 horses. Somebody said to the race, they said, no, he just fed them and looked at them. They didn't do much, but he just loved horses. He had his eye knocked out by a horse. So he was a, one, a little one-eyed farmer. And he didn't get a lot of schooling or anything, but he had a wonderful, a wonderful heart. Did not accept anybody be, uh, talking, uh, you know, and being uncharitable. And um, we'd get mad, you know, over something with the doctors because he had very bad cancer for nine years. And he never complained. He had the worst cancer that couldn't operate his nerve in the back. And, and you'd say to him, Pether, how are you? And he'd say, not so bad. That's all he ever, in fact, they have it on his memorial card, not so bad. But he, and I'm telling you this for you, those of you who are suffering. You know, in all those years, nine years, he came to the door of death several times, be in the hospital and say, take him home, he's going to die. He was only 69 when he died. The wonderful sense of humor, and he'd say, no, let me home. And as long as he could have, which he did, I prayed hard, he'd give them up, but he smoked 60 cigarettes till he died. Anyway, the doctor said, it'll kill you if you stop. Anyway, he had the most wonderful encounter, nothing to do with me, of St. Faustina. A farmer, and the local farmer in the area, brought him this picture of St. Faustina. I don't know much the farmer knew, but when I went to visit him, my sister-in-law said, he keeps talking about the nun. And of course, they all know me at home as the nun. So it wasn't the nun, he was this nun. But he had this little picture of Faustina, and he looked at it all the time. And this was not, you know, he, was a, he went to Mass, he was a good man. But this wasn't a devotion. I, don't, I had never spoken to him about it much. She changed his whole life. His, he, he would love when Father Kevin would come visit and the priest would come. So before the, just before he died, I phoned him. I, wasn't, um, I came home after I was able to walk and get back my, my health to the degree that I could come and visit him in Ireland. But about a, a week before he, about a week or so before he died, I was giving a talk on suffering. I thought, one day I was at adoration, I'm going to call Pether. And I'm going to ask him how he had a sense of humor and joy and every day 30 and 40 people coming to see him. Wonderful sense of humor, great storytelling. So I called him up and I said, Pether, I know you have suffered for nine years and they can't give you much treatment and ease the pain and the colostomy. He had a lot, a lot of suffering never complained, never, was always telling the doctors, there's more people sick in the hospital, take your time. And the wife would be getting mad, she didn't have the same grace. She'd be saying, don't be saying anything to them. And he'd say, but there's more people than me in this hospital. So I said, Pether, what keeps you going? How are you able to manage with this? And as quick as anything, he said, you know, when Father brings me Jesus, and he said, you know, that anointing of the sick, it's powerful. And he started telling me about what the sacraments did for him and how th they kept him going. He wasn't healed, he said, but he says, I get great grace. And then he said, and the nun, which was Faustina. And he died. He had over two and a half thousand people at his funeral. He was known all over. Why? Because, you know, instead of people feeling sympathy for him, he would draw the people to him. And I certainly believe that he was like in the boat, the storm, but he knew Jesus was there. And that's what I want you tonight. 
to realize there's no sickness. Do miracles happen? Yes. I was writing down some of the just reason, just to encourage you. You know, we give a retreat, um, retreats missions during Lent in different parts of the world. We go to Knock every year. In Knock, I could write a book on the miracles I hear years later. What happened? I, I there was a man in Knock who, who told me one time that he was going in for serious surgery, tumors removed. And at the Eucharistic Healing Service in Knock, he begged to come. And the following Tuesday, he went in for the surgery, and there was no tumors. He didn't see me, but he did see Jesus. Another was a mother who came from Belfast, a Protestant woman who was told by a seminarian's mother um, they met in the supermarket. And she was desperate because her little girl was in a coma in the Royal Victoria with a virus. And of course, the woman didn't know, she was crying, and the woman, the Catholic woman, told her all about Father Kevin and Sister Breach, and we'd been knock. And of course, the woman was all like, nothing, didn't mean much to her who Sister Breach and Father Kevin was. But she said, you know, Sister Breach is the gift of healing. You should really go. And she was desperate. She had never been to the Republic of Ireland. She had never been at a Catholic, anything Catholic. She left Belfast and left her husband with the child and came down to knock. And can you imagine how daunting it was? This young Protestant girl, she comes in to knock and there's thousands there in the shrine. And during the healing service, she heard me saying, you know, this is a person. This is the same Jesus who walked the earth. This is the same Jesus who touched all those people in the Bible we read about. And I said, tonight, today, you look at him. It's not a feeling. You know, people say, oh, I don't feel anything. You don't have to feel. All you have to do is, with your lips, say, Jesus, I believe. I want to believe. Please help me. So I said, take all your people, those you love, and give them to Jesus. Well, she came. Of course, her idea was to meet this nun. Well, she didn't see me because there were thousands of people. But she told the story that when... Father, as you know, to do in knock, you know, carried the monstrance around the different parts. When Father was carried, she was in one section, and she said, all she kept hearing was me saying, look at Jesus. And then she said, she realized, well, I do believe in Jesus. She was a faith-filled Christian. And she said, I don't understand everything that sisters did, but Jesus, I'm desperate. I have only one little girl, and they don't give me any hope she'll recover from this virus. And she pleaded with Jesus there, she told. Guess what? She got home, and at the same hour in Belfast, her little girl was healed. That's Jesus. That's the power. And that's why I tell you that, you know, miracles do happen. There's another, which um, a doctor who was healed. We were up in RD. I don't remember who it was. But there was a doctor who had very bad cancer and he came to see me. And he came to meet me later to tell me that he was completely... He, and he didn't really, he said to me, you know, that he didn't really believe that he would get it because it's hard for medical people because they know so much about the medical sickness and about needs but he said sister I came I was desperate because I wasn't given much hope and three days later he was completely healed then you find others who get the grace who get the grace we there father Kevin was speaking there about it. I remember being in Sydney Father Kevin was preaching at a mass for a group of nuns. And this is why I'd say to you at this point, Pope Francis is telling us to read the word of God, to read the scriptures, to carry a scripture. Because you know, when you read the scriptures, it's like water, it's like pure crystal grace going through into your body, into your emotional life, your sexual, all those areas that Satan wants to attack. When you read the word of God, this is a book alive, but it's no good closed. But I remember Father Kevin reading the gospel and then giving a short homily during the week. We were over ministering in Australia. And a blind nun 
came in with her white walking stick. It was a regular mass. It wasn't a big crowd. It was in a convent. And during the word of God, she was healed. It wasn't Father Kevin. That's why I tell you, the word of God is alive and active. The gospel preached is the presence of God. And then we have him in his Eucharistic presence. And the last thing I would say to you, I'll have to tell you this, uh, when our brother was talking today about, Me Phil, about Medjugorje, which I was delighted because I'm a great follower. I go there, I'd go there and live if I could, but it wouldn't happen. But I was in Medjugorje last year, and I have to tell you this humorous story. Maybe the lady's here. I think she's from me. But anyway, <clears throat> I didn't have my veil on because, you know, when I go to Medjugorje, I go as a pilgrim. And it's hard for me to go incognito because I have a big space and I have a face that knows. But I thought, well, I'll just go. Nobody will recognize me. I don't have my veil on. I fool myself. Anyway, I'm walking down the street past Columbus. You know that famous place we Irish all go into? And I hear this woman shouting, Sister Breach, I haven't seen you in 20 some years. Come here to me. <laughs> and she said, you were on the Mike Murphy show the television show, which I was, and Mike Murphy, I think it was called. And she said, you know, I just came in from the hospital. If you're here, I hope I have the story right. She said, I just came in, crippled with a big bag of medicine, terrible pain, crippled. And she said, I turned on the TV, and there you were. And she said, I couldn't believe my eyes. You were praying over the television. You said, wherever you are in Ireland, you just know Jesus is there. And she said, Sister Breach, I was healed instantly, but I never got a chance to tell you to now. <laughs> but you know, but I remembered that. I remembered the day because when Mike Murphy announced on the radio in the morning time, how foolish, that Sister Breach, the healing nun, was going to be on the show that night. RT was bombarded with calls. So he'd said to me, what are we going to do? There's loads of people who want to see you. And as quick as I said, but you can pray over the TV. Jesus is not limited. So there's lots of people left today. And I told them this. I said, listen, when you're on the bus or if you're listening by the media or on the train, tonight you may have loved ones in some part of the world. That Jesus is there too. Because he is every place. And I see miracles through the media. I see it through the telephone. I was in my office one day and a woman called. She called the prayer line by mistake. But she decided she didn't know we had a prayer line. She listened to the prayer line. And I was talking about Jesus and telling him, Jesus is right here, prayer. And she was healed of a paralyzed arm. So she called the office then. She said, oh my God, I wasn't even praying for myself. But she said, now I realize Jesus is alive, right? So praise God. We're going to pray with you. And there are many different ways that God wants to heal you tonight. But let him do what he wants. He loves you. Jesus is looking at you now. And Father Kevin has a wonderful saying that he often says to people, you know, Jesus is over the moon about you. He's delighted with you. Does he want to heal you? Yes. It may not be physical, but ask for the physical. Be like Bartimaeus. Don't let a discouragement. If you have cancer, if you have a little child who is sick, if you have discouragement, depression, emotional, pray, beg Jesus. And what I want you to do during the prayers, when Father Kevin and Father uh, Michael is here, when we will be praying, the three of us, different areas, I want you, you don't have to close your eyes, you picture, you see here, that's just an image, but that's the person. But if it helps you to look at the divine mercy, whether it's here or here, and I'll ask Jesus, he'd walk through this auditorium. He will ask you the question, do you believe I can do this? And he doesn't... He knows you struggle. He knows we have doubts. He knows that we think there's too many people, my little intention. But he individually asks us that question. So don't be afraid to ask him. And remember what he said. 
because of your faith it will be done. And I will pray the, at the end of our praying, I'll pray for all the intentions here in these baskets or boxes and also for all the people who are not here. And I want you at that time to visualize Jesus walking in as he did in that hospital in Belfast for that little girl. He walked in and laid his hand upon her and healed her. We see that all the time. So let's now prepare and maybe we could have a song of worship to the Blessed Sacrament. And in your heart, you prepare now to ask Jesus. And we will pray, we'll join our prayers with you that Jesus will touch you and heal you. And I can guarantee you that Jesus will answer your prayer. So let us prepare now. Worship him, thank him, and pray. God bless you. Lord, we acknowledge your presence here. Oh, please remain seated. Please remain seated. Yeah. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, that you have made it so easy for us to come to you. You have said, come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Lord, we come from a restless, anxiety-ridden society where nothing seems stable anymore where people have stopped believing in you, have ceased to come to you, people who no longer believe that you are Lord, that you are Savior, that you are the one who is for us the bread of life, that you are the one who takes away our sins. Lord, we come to you now this evening. You knew me, Lord, before I was born. And you have known every moment of my life. And you have recorded every pain, every wound, every hurt that we have received or inflicted. And we beg you, Lord, to heal us. Lord, heal those that I have hurt by my tongue, by my attitude by my prejudice, by my blindness, by my deafness, my unwillingness to see and to hear. 
Heal me, Lord, of the wounds I've inflicted on the poor, on the downtrodden, by ignoring them and refusing to help them out of my substance. I have wounded so many, Lord. And my own wounds, Lord Jesus. How I have been wounded. Sometimes maybe I deserved. But nevertheless, I have felt the pain. I have felt the heartbreak. I have felt the disappointment. I have felt the alienation from brothers and sisters who no longer walked with me or allowed me to walk with them. Lord Jesus, you know all of this. You know the broken places of my life better than I do. And for my brothers and sisters here, Lord, tonight, I pray that you would pour out your healing spirit upon them and restore them and renew them. Restore them to their, the heritage of their faith and the heritage of your love for them. Mary, we know that you sit with us here this evening and that where your son Jesus is, you're not far away. We turn to you. We bless you. We love you. We ask you to help us through your motherly care and intercession. Look out for us, Mother Mary, and help us. Jesus, I adore you. Jesus, I believe that you're truly present here. I acknowledge, Jesus, that you alone, you alone, Lord, are the healer, the giver of life. Jesus, tonight we thank you for your mercy that heals, for your love. And tonight, Lord Jesus, I come with my brothers and sisters who have come with great suffering. Lord, as you look from your hidden throne here, please, Jesus, walk among your people here. Lay your healing hand upon those, Lord, who are suffering from, from sicknesses, physical infirmities. You see the pain. You see, Lord Jesus, the suffering in the human hearts the burdens that your children here carry, the storms that they've encountered on their pilgrimage of sickness, of unhappiness, of children who are ill, of marriages that are difficult, and some, those who have suffered greatly because of the sicknesses of others, the loved ones, parents and children, those, Lord, in this auditorium who are stricken with cancer, so many of them facing surgery or treatment. Jesus, I beg you here tonight, please, Jesus, extend your healing hand into every person here, especially those with sicknesses, whether it is incurable, whether it is a chronic pain and the need, Lord, for your healing, please heal them. Tonight, Jesus, I thank you that you do heal us in sovereign ways. I thank you, Lord, that we believe in miracles. Tonight, I pray also for doctors. I thank you for the skills of our medical people because you have chosen these men and women all over the world, even those who don't believe Jesus, you have used them to bring comfort and healing through the skills of their medical profession. Tonight, we beg you, Lord Jesus, to bless the doctors that we attend, the doctors who treat us, to, Lord, touch them through our faith. 
Use these men and women, Lord, to touch and to bring through the skills of medicine, healing and comfort to those who are sick and in need. We thank you, Lord, for our pharmacists, for those in research who have found medicine, because we know too, Lord Jesus, that through the great gift of medicine, many of us are able to live and to live with health, healthy lives because of the treatments and the medication. Tonight, Jesus, I pray for all those who are taking treatment, who are on medication, that it will do more than prescribe, please, Jesus, bring comfort, find healings, Lord, allow through the skills of our medical people to find means to bring relief and healing to the bodies, the minds, and the spirits. I pray tonight, Lord Jesus, for all those who care for the mentally and physically handicapped, so many of those who are often rejected because of their mental and physical handicaps. Lord Jesus, Bless those who care for them. Use them, Jesus, as healing channels. Bless all of those who work in our hospitals and in our homes. Lord, and who care for those who cannot care for themselves, for the elderly. Lord, so often people feel sympathy for elderly people, but it is beautiful. We know, Jesus, you love, you have given long lives. Give them a spirit of joy, and in their suffering of old age, help them to remember, Jesus, that you just love them, and help them to unite the difficulties they reach in their bodies, their spirits. Mary, we ask you as a mother to take all of these intentions to the throne of Jesus here, and to beg him to heal, to restore, and to strengthen us. And we pray to you, St. Faustina, you had great suffering and you felt the hurt of people who didn't understand. There are times too, Lord Jesus, that we feel people don't care or understand. We feel the loneliness in suffering, in our pains. We feel so often isolated because of our sickness. Faustina, all this you experienced when you were left alone or criticized because of your sickness. Tonight we ask you, Saint Faustina, you are with Jesus now. It was all worth it. You united your sufferings with Jesus. He told you, give it to me. We ask you, Faustina, to help us, that we too will never allow ourselves to become embittered or angry, but will unite our sufferings to the sufferings of Jesus to the sufferings that win salvation for us on the cross, his suffering. We pray to you, Pope John Paul, you also a great man of mercy, a great saint of mercy. You suffered greatly, but you were not afraid to embrace your suffering. Pope John Paul, how often all of us remember you in those days of your great, great suffering. And yet, you said, now is the time for the Pope to suffer, to carry the cross. We ask you, Pope John Paul, tonight, we ask you to please help us to also be able to carry the crosses in our lives, not with fear or discouragement, but please pray for us that we too will be driven by our love for Jesus, that we too will reach out so that we may receive Jesus through those who minister and whom we ministered. And I pray also to all our patron saints, tonight I pray for those who are not in this auditorium, who are here today, who had to return home, for those who would love to be here, who are too sick to come, or whatever other reason cannot be here. Jesus, at this moment, touch them at this very moment in their desire to be here with us. And I pray for all of our families. I ask you, Jesus, to walk in. We believe like the centurion, you've only to say your word from this place of power. Say your word that our families may be healed, that those we love who are sick and old and 
confined to their homes, who cannot come to this conference. Tonight, we pray, Jesus, and we bring them before you. We put them in front of you tonight, Lord, and we ask you to please touch every one of our families. And I pray especially that the mercy of Jesus will flow out to all those who are on their deathbeds, those who are close to dying, those who need to experience mercy and forgiveness. Please, Jesus, heal them tonight, especially those who have left the church, those who are hurt by the church, those who are in need of the compassion and love of you, Jesus. Let it flow to them tonight. And I ask you also, Mary as a mother, to please intercede for us. And all these intentions in these boxes, these are the heartfelt prayers, Jesus, and I ask you to look at them, to touch them, every intention. And you know, I just have such a great sense of Jesus just smiling and, and saying these words to us. You know, don't limit me. You will see my power manifested. Just believe. And I just have a great sense that there are people here who have been really begging for the conversion of their children and their, their loved ones, for people to come back to the faith, for people living in lives of sin. And the sense I have is Jesus saying to tell you, you pray, you trust, you live for me, and I will take care. No one who puts their trust in me will be disappointed. Jesus guarantees us that as we pray and trust, that he will not, he wants more than you do, your loved ones and my loved ones who are wandered from the truth and from the church and from, from him. He wants them. He died for them. And he tells you tonight, I will do what I alone can do. You do what I ask you. Believe in me, trust in me. Father Michael is going to pray, you know, this, uh, just say a word to you. This is the year, and the Archbishop mentioned it, of uh, the year for consecrated men and women. Father Michael is going to pray for all the consecrated men and women here. But I would like to say before he prays, just to, to, to tell those of you here who are religious men and women, that on the... I think it's the 17th, 18th, and 19th of July in All Hallows College, where um, I got the, 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 the word from the Lord to have a retreat, especially for the consecrated men and women. And we have Father Cantalamesa, who is the papal uh, preacher, as you know, and he's written many beautiful books on consecrated life and the vows. So those of you who are consecrated, who are nuns, priests, like consecrated virgins, lay, um, consecrated women, brothers. If you know of a brother or a priest, that, a religious, tell them, because it'll be a wonderful opportunity. It'll be three days. I will be ministering at it, and we'll have a Father Cantal Mesa, and uh, we will have a big healing service for them. Father will give a series of talks. It'll be a wonderful, enriching weekend. So it will be in the Irish Catholic, and we are having a meeting, a group of us on the committee, next week to, uh, for the final plan to send out the brochures. But we'll ask Father now. It's a wonderful gift. Ireland has been blessed, and we have to pray for vocations. We have to pray that God will raise up a generosity of young men and women again to, to bring the gospel through this consecrated life, through complete dedication. And I can tell you, I'm 54 years in religious life, and I ju it gets better all the time. It's a wonderful life to give your life to Jesus. So, Father. And this is, you, you know who Father, he's the spiritual director for the Divine Mercy, but he's also just got his doctorate on Frank Duff on the Legion of Mary. So, and the Salesian. I'm going to suggest something to you which might help, which will help. Um, 
Cancer now has almost touched every family. There is an answer, there is a cure for cancer. But our medical people are breaking their brains out to find the answer. But I think if we all committed ourselves to saying one Hail Mary a day, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of the church, the mother of each one of us, that she would guide the minds and the hearts of our medical scientific people. I've met one or two young women who are doing research in cancer. And I said, you might be very the one that the prayer is going to be manifested in you. Try something different. Don't be afraid to follow a hunch because that could be the very answer that God wants to give. So just, you know, we'll play our part by saying a little Hail Mary every day that God will bless our doctors and nurses who are researching the whole area of cancer. Don Bosco, our founder, I'm also religious. And like Bridge, you know, um, when you're a religious, you know, you have good days and bad days. And it's just like an ordinary family. Like we have visitors in our house in Crumlin, and I'd be saying to them, sure, we'd like a crowd of children, really, you know? I mean, you'd be full of, you know, development and fun and games some days, and then another you know, you'd be having a little spatter with somebody. You know, it's just like an ordinary family. But in the long run, something very beautiful is happening. You know, you're being transformed, you're being trained, your, the Lord is bringing in, his blessed mother is bringing us to, you know, something new, something special, bringing you to the place where he wants you. Once on, by, by the way, it's the bicentenary of Don Bosco this year. It's 200 years since he was born. And there's celebrations going on all over the world this year, starting on the 31st of January. Somebody said to him one day, you know, why do we have all these religious orders, you know? Why do we have all these here in the church, you know? Do we, do we need them all? And he said, well, I'll tell you what now, Don Bosco said. If you go to the mother of a large family, large family, and ask her, which one of her children would you like to do without? And you'll soon get the answer to what God and the church, what the church say. We treasure every little family. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new consecrated groups in the church since Vatican II. And they really are blossoming out across the world. And, you know, even if, even if only a small number of those became as big as the religious orders that are there today, you'll be shocked at what will happen. But we still, first of all, we have to face into this purification. You know, but look, we'll do it. And we'll come through it. And we'll help one another. And when we do that, we'll be ready then to be better instruments for God for building, for building the renewed church. Don't ever say building a new church. It's not a new church. It's a church that has been renewed. And the one thing I'd say to you is, if you can work for unity, like when I see what happened to those young men in, 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 in Egypt, and their brothers and family celebrating now, because they said, we have 21 martyrs in our village. That's the kind of spirit we have to develop, because there's going to be difficult days ahead. But I'm, not, I'm an optimist by nature, and I say to you, you know, that once we're purified, we we'll want to give. And how do you give? You give in many different ways. Because God has a plan for each one of you, a plan for me. And one of the ways we can do that is by taking vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and living in religious communities. And the new communities are beautiful. And John Paul II started a night once, I think, around, around Pentecost, of bringing them together. God, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Unbelievable. And some of them are big groups, and some of them are small groups. But it doesn't matter. They're all precious. They're all children in the family, the church. But what I'd say to you is this. The age profile at the moment in most of the religious communities is up, 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 up. In our community in Crumlin, um, there's one in his 40s, one in his 50s, one of his 60s, and then the rest half in 70s and half in 80s. That's who we are. But like, it, 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 we're living a different experience. But we're always called to love. One man is kind of getting very forgetful now and doesn't do silly things and that, you know. But it's, it's, it, that's where we're at. An ordinary family has to cope with that. We have to cope with that today. But pray for the religious. I think that's wonderful what Sister Beza will tell us about in, in, in July. June? June? In the, 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 the,
17, 18, and 19. July. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday July. in July, July. in Al And will be in the Irish Catholic anyway. You know, yeah. So uh, all the nuns and priests and brothers who are here today from the religious communities will know that, you know, know because you'll be well warned in the Irish Catholic. So again, you're praying for the families, the religious families, who are so precious to the church. That each one of them is precious. Like it's now you're saying, well, we'll, be, we'll pray now the Salesians do well. It's no use to Salesians do well if the Jesuits and the Dominicans and the Cistercians and the Benedictines aren't doing well. They must all do well. That's what God wants. He wants healthy religious communities. And that's what we're praying for. So we, of course, will pray for physical healing for the older ones and that God will bring great things in their lives and bring them to, uh, uh, you know, I've just finished six years in the, as a community leader in Crumlin. And... Uh, <clears throat> Somebody said to me, you're there to help them to pray, pray for a, a, a good end to their lives. But that doesn't mean you stop. There's one man in our community, and he goes off downtown, and he goes to concerts, and he goes to museums, and he goes, to, and I said, oh, here's our scout. He tells us what's going on around the city. And he's a great fella, you know, but he's up in his 70s, well into his 70s. So, you know, like, as I say, we're like any ordinary family, and we're precious we see each one of them as being precious and you know we work and help them and the whole thing is that we our policy would be and most communities policies would be you hold them as long as you can and then when they get to the point that they need nursing care and all that then you may have to go to nursing and some of the religious communities have their own nursing homes it's very beautiful you know because it's they've been used to a life of prayer they've been used to that's why when i see them and i saw it with one or two of our people and it hurt me very very much and I couldn't do anti at the time. But, you know, they need a religious atmosphere where they can pray and they can go down and say a few prayers of the Blessed Sacrament. Or they can, you know, there's, there's a kind of a, a supportive atmosphere for their faith. So pray about that as well. Because, like, some of the religious communities, they could afford to build one of these things because it's quite a big expense. But some of the missionary congregations had a lot of men out in the missions. And they're coming home now for their retirement and to pray and to do wonderful things when they're back home. So they had to take care of the sick men and the older men coming home from the missions. So there's a whole area there that needs prayer. And, you know, I think Francis, Pope Francis is wonderful. He really is just because we're in a very special time i was having an argument with somebody recently and he said to me you know he's like a dragnet he's out trying to catch as many as he can while he can and you know there's truth in that you know he won't sacrifice any of the basic beliefs of that but by god he'll try to win them over i mean imagine to go down and meet the people off the boats from north africa i mean unbelievable but he's doing things like this all the time He's a holy man, and he's given to us at this time. And remember, we've had some very holy, holy papal cardinals who were at that consistory and prayed hard. And this is what the Holy Spirit gave us. You know, so I think we need to cherish him and love him because he's a very special person. And... He's a religious. He's the first Jesuit ever Pope. So, I mean, that's beautiful, you know, that he's, 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 he knows what is to live in community. He knows what is called to holiness. He knows what, where we're going, what we should be doing. And, like, he's not a bit afraid. I, 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 <laughs> I was going to hesitate to tell you this, but anyway, somebody I know, Salesian, very high places, and uh, he was very keen to retire beside Pope Benedict and Pope Benedict, oh no, no, you must go back to your community. <laughs> he didn't like to hear that. So anyway, he got a place, a com very comfortable place near the Vatican. And Francis heard this. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> So, you know, he's not afraid to t t correct any of us. You know, he's not afraid to correct anybody. No matter how high up or how low they are. And you see, there's the physical side, there's the spiritual side, and there's the material side. 
So we need to pray for all that, that our hearts are converted. You know, I mean, about myself, you know, I have an awful habit about pens, pens. And I said to myself, you know, I said, you're as bad as anybody else because you, 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 you put too much emphasis on those pens. And once I had a beautiful collection of pens and I was shifting house and the whole lot of them disappeared. <laughs> What's he telling me? What's he telling me? Let go, Michael. Let go. Francis had nothing. St. Francis of Assisi, you know? So we have Francis of Assisi, we have Francis Xavier, and we have Frank Duff, another Francis. Pray for his canonization, because when he's canonized, he'll be a huge example for the wider worldwide church. So again, we'll say a prayer now for all our... <clears throat> We'll say my prayer for all our religious that they won't get discouraged because we want them to give life to the people around them. No matter what age they are, they can give life. So Lord, give them life now. New life. Your life of the Holy Spirit. Your life in Jesus Christ for the glory of God the Father. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Now. Now we're going straight into night prayer, then we'll repose the blessed sacrament. Okay. Oh God, come to our aid. Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. Just a short examination of conscience. Just sorry, Lord, for anything we got wrong today, so... Please forgive us. And if in Lord have mercy and hear me. When I will we'll do it on two sides, my right here, we'll start and this, on my left we'll do the second verse. When I call, answer me, O God of justice, from anguish you release me, have mercy and hear me. Oh, then, how long will your hearts be closed? Will you love what is futile and seek what is false? It is the Lord who grants favors to those whom he loves. The Lord hears me whenever I call him. Fear him, do not sin. Ponder on your bed and be still. Make justice your sacrifice and trust in the Lord. What can, man, what can bring us happiness, many say. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. What can bring us happiness, many say. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord heart a greater joy than they have from abundance of corn and new wine. I will let down in peace and sleep comes at once, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy, mercy and, hear, and me. hear me. Bless the Lord through the night. O come, bless the Lord, all you who serve the Lord. Who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord through the night. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made both heaven and earth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Bless the, bless Lord, the Lord through, through the night. night. Reading from Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed us, Lord God of truth. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Save us, Lord, while we are awake. Protect us while we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest with him in peace. At last, all-powerful Master, 
you give leave to your servant to go in peace according to your promise. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all nations, the light to enlighten the Gentiles and give glory to Israel, your people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Save us, Lord, Lord while we are awake. awake. Protect, Protect us while we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest, and rest with, with him in peace. Let us pray. <clears throat> Come to visit us, Lord, this night, so that by your strength we may rise at daybreak to rejoice in the resurrection of Christ, your Son who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you all. We ask the Lord now to bless, first of all, surround everybody, yourselves, your families, your friends. Well, in, I used to say Timbuktu, but I won't say that anymore because I learned where it is. So, <laughs> education, television. But we surround everybody now. Family, whether they're in Europe, Asia, South America, Africa, Australia, doesn't matter where they are. Put them all in this prayer of this blessing now. Surround the whole lot in the precious blood of Jesus. Consecrate them in the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And seal them now. Keep them safe, Lord. Seal them in your most precious blood. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. May the Lord grant you a quiet night and a perfect end. And we'll sing the Salve Regina together. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcedo, Estes Nostra Salve, A Te Clamamus, Exulis Ilihevi, A Te Suspiramus, Gementes et flentes in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo advocata nostra illos tuos misericordes oculos ad nos convert. Et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ascende. O clemens, O everybody we'll see you in the morning at uh, 